Well, the reaction to that long um, real-time video the other day on the twin reverb was so good that I thought I'd do it again. So this is the 65 Super Reverb. I'm gonna recap this. Now this one has already been recapped, not very well. So my approach on this is a little bit different than I'll do on say the uh, 64 or 65 basement. That's, I guess it's a 65 basement that's over there. This still has the original caps. I'll show that uh, coming up soon. Uh, I guess I should show the first thing I do with any of these things because I don't mention it in all the videos and people are always like, oh my goodness, I make sure there's no voltage waiting to get me. Zero volts, zero volts. But you know, I do check. I don't put it in every video because I'm not here to be a uh, an instructor per se. I'm showing how I do stuff. Now, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna snip some of these old, these, you know, old replace caps. Out. These have J hooks. I don't need that, but I'm not removing the, the wire going into the solder joint yet. I might have use for that as far as the leads beneath the board go, because usually the old leads from the old capacitors are in fact the leads beneath the board. So I'm gonna leave a little bit of the old leads poking out. And if this were, if these were original caps from Mallory, et cetera, with a brown cardboard tubes like toilet paper. I would uh, carefully remove them and put them in a bag for all the collectors out there who like such things. But uh, since these were not very well replaced, non-originals, I don't care about them in the slightest, so they are gone. Uh, let's see, where's my dental pick? Uh, it was here just a few minutes ago. It probably still is here. Probably right in front of me somewhere. This is an auspicious beginning to the video, don't you think? Oh, right here, I'm hiding behind my socket wrench. Um, I guess I should point out to any of the, uh, the linemen out there or electricians who do house installs who are having a heart attack at seeing me wear a steel bracelet watch for this. Not only is there no voltage here, but the risk of, of uh, arcing with these things, even when the amp is on, is, is very, very low. So I'm not too concerned about it. Uh, I want to get the old leads, you know, the wires, out of these solder joints. And I'm leaving the screws holding the board in place so that when I pull up, I have something to pull against. And then I will kind of straighten these so that when I lift this board up, so when I lift, when I lift this board up, uh, they will pull out neatly. Come on, you know you want to come out. That one was all curved under, which is a good thing. Now, I have not taken any notes on how this was wired before because I have done this hundreds of hundreds of times. I've got this entire app memorized. Everything about this I can draw in my sleep. But if this is not your hundred something time to do this before you remove anything, take pictures, make drawings, make notes to yourself. Don't write on the chassis where things go. Don't write on the chassis where the positive ends are. Don't write on the board where the positive ends are, etc. I see that, sadly, all too many times. Right here, I've got the old leads from the old capacitors in these three solder joints. I'm getting them out while I'm in the neighborhood. Uh, they were left in place, and there's only so many things you can have in one of these eyelets at, at a time, so it's best to get them out. Uh, here, here, and on the negatives, the old capacitor leads are actually the uh, the wires going underneath the board from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here, and here, looping over to here, underneath. So I'm uh, 
not trying to pull these wires up right now. I will get them out if necessary, or I will neaten them up as I go. All right. I got this negative. I'm going to get these up in the air. Got this last negative here. And uh, talk about series caps in these. What's happening electronically is the positive, this red wire here, which is coming from the rectification, is going here. And then it's connected to a capacitor that goes here, so the positive and the negative. It's also going to here, which is a 220K resistor, which goes here and then from here underneath the board to here, and then from here to here, which then goes to the positive of, of another cap in series to here where the negative, the ground is, but it also goes underneath here and here. So this 220K is in parallel across this cap. Each capacitor in series has a resistor in parallel across it. And those resistors, because they are the same value or supposed to be the same, we'll measure them before I remove them. Um, force this to be an even voltage divider of half voltage on here and half voltage on here. So say you've got 600 volts total, each capacitor is going to have exactly 300 volts across it. Without these resistors, you may have 400 volts across one cap and 200 across the other, and that can make a capacitor run closer to its, uh, you know, these are 350 volt rated caps. It can make it run at or above its operating conditions, depending on what the actual capacitance is. Because if you just have a capacitor here, I'm not explaining this very well, but I'm just kind of doing a summary. If the capacitors don't have the resistors forcing an equal voltage, the, any difference in capacitance will make them have a difference in actual voltage. The resistor forces them to have the same voltage, even if the capacitance from this cap to this cap is off by 10, 20% which is good. Uh, the other thing it does is it gives it a path to ground. So when you power the amp off, if you leave the amp in standby, uh, there is a path for the voltage to drain from here through these bleeder resistors to ground. And it takes about a minute. Uh, and if, you're in if you leave it in play rather than standby, then all these caps discharge back through the choke through these resistors as well. All right, so it is now time for me to remove these two screws. And there is a giant fat fly in my room. It is driving me crazy with its buzzing. If it comes close enough, I'll try to get it with chopsticks or a soldering iron. That'd be dramatic as, I, as my channel gets taken away for animal cruelty. So now this will all just lift out because I straightened all these wires. And this is the backing board. And this is the dirty, dirty chassis. And I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup here. Just to I need to clean up th this board now. And I'll clean the surrounding chassis a bit just to show you one of the steps that will be coming up in this. I'm just getting a lot of this dust off dirt. So I start with isopropyl because it does not hurt anything and it evaporates. And there's just no risk of, of a problem. I'll probably do a more thorough chassis cleaning with... Uh, naphtha because it's more aggressive than isopropyl but it does you know it's also a do no harm kind of thing and it gets more off but look at all that that's cigarette smoke from you know 1972 whatever it also got in the rich corinthian leather of the time but uh You can see the color of the chassis that was never exposed to cigarette smoke versus the color of the chassis that was. And I like to try to clean it up a little bit. It doesn't have to be, it's not really because it's pretty, though pretty is a nice side effect, but all that nicotine and other gunk in the air is over the years. That gets down in the tube sockets, that gets down in your switches and your jacks and stuff, and it makes the chassis itself uh, have an oily, sticky kind of feel to it, like a film. So. Cleaning that off, even just a little bit, makes it feel much nicer. But this is not there yet. This will take uh, NAPTA and or WD-40 to get really as clean as the old stuff. Anyway, the important thing here is I made sure there was no old flux or solder residue uh, on this board. It is clean again. You know, it's uh, 
it has dried out a little bit over the years. It is um, a very dark gray rather than a black. That's typical, but I know that this is actually, in fact, clean. And when I put all the stuff on the new board, put the board back, I won't have any possible path for uh, a leakage in here. It will not be conductive. Now, sometimes these old backer boards warp or get really, really dirty, or they have, you know, huge gobs of, of, uh, of uh, flux kind of baked in. And I'll get out more, I'll get out the isopropyl with a old soft bristle toothbrush and really work that in there. In this case, this just needed the surface level cleaning. So it's time to put the chassis to the side. And maybe readjust the focus because it's gone from here to here. Actually, it looks like I've got a pretty good depth of field for this. As I talk right in the mic, it looks like I've got a pretty good depth of field, so I don't need to adjust the focus. I will do a post-production zoom in this area probably so you get a better sense of this area. Um, I'm about to cause an awful lot of heat, and I don't want to burn my cutting mat. These cutting mats are great. Uh, I've got a cheap silicone mat down on the bench you can't see, and then the cutting mat on top of it just protects the wood of the table. And every six months or so, I change out the cutting mat. This one's actually lasted longer than many, but over time they warp and things don't lay flat, which is a problem. So I'm gonna double over some paper towel. Oops, I tore it wrong, let me add one more piece. And I do have lint-free shop towels that I use as well when it's necessary. But for things like this, it's not really necessary. Now, on the other side of the board, you can see those old leads bent over, making the junctions like I, I mentioned. Um, normally, I would heat up the old solder and tap it out into my trash can. Uh, but that would not, I would have to move the camera and all that. I'm just going to do it here onto this towel for you, your own amusement so you can see it. I can use a solder sucker as well, but the first thing I like to do is just tap out the excess. So heat that up really well, and bloop. That's the technical term, bloop. And this stuff is really damn hot. Don't touch those little splashes if you do this. Let them cool off a minute, or they will let you know how hot they actually were. So I've got the old lead falling out there from that, from an added cap. I'll get more of it out in just a moment. Right now I'm, I'm in solder blooping mode more than lead removal mode. That was actually obstructing the solder from coming out though, so. And from time to time, I'll clean the tip of my iron off because that old solder kind of burns off the flux it used to have. And uh, at that point, it becomes pretty yucky. It gets real grainy and can be a little bit harsh on the soldering iron tip. Oh, I said I'd mention, I'd, I said, told you guys I'd measure these resistors for you. So let's, let's measure those resistors before I remove them. These are supposed to each be 220K. These are one watt resistors in here. 246.3, 248.8. It's supposed to be a 1K. It measures 1.108, and this is a 4.7. Measures 4.9. So they're pretty close to spec, but uh, carbon composite resistors, even one watts, are really not good choices these days uh, for a power supply. And they offer no sonic benefit. 
they they absorb moisture and they drift. And uh, once they absorb moisture and start to drift, they can generate heat and accelerate their drift and their failure. So I like to put in either metal oxides or uh, wire wounds or uh, metal films. In this case, I'm gonna use some two watt metal films that Vichy makes that are really nice. so that I won't have to worry about any of that happening. They handle higher temperatures. They're more resistant to humidity. They can handle more power through them as they're two watts and they're better matched and very unlikely to drift in this uh, usage, so. I think if Leo had had them available at a low price, in the 60s, he might've used them as well, but they were not available then. And he, Leo was using these one watts because it was the best on the market. Now, a lot of the 60s fenders also had some half watts versus the one watts. Half watt is sufficient for every one of these purposes here. And other places in a fender amp, a, a one watt is preferable to a half watt. All right, now let's see, I've got an extra lead here I wanna get rid of. Oh, touch, I oops, I touched one of those things. I did the thing I told you not to do. You can brand yourself with those very easily. I don't recommend it, but you, you can if you feel like it. So I'm getting the ex, extra lead out and leaving the original lead in. Now, I never expect the bloop to get all of it out, but it gets an awful lot out and saves me time with the desoldering braid and the desoldering pump. In the uh, Fender Twin video the other day, I said my buddy Brad, Brad's Guitar Garage has a really cool uh, solder pump, desoldering pump, but it's noisy and gets clogged sometimes. I meant he had a desoldering station. I was thinking about the work in front of me in front of me more than the words coming out of my mouth. It's a hazard of doing such things on the fly. All right, now I'm gonna get these resistors out. And I'll return them with the amp. So if some collector looks at the work I do after this and say, oh my gosh, that is way too reliable and, and efficient and uh, neat they can have someone put these old carbon composites back. No player has ever played one of these that when I finished and said, wow, that sucks. I think if you're to travel back in time and ask Leo Fender about carbon comps versus other spec resistors for this purpose, he would look like it's you like you had lobs like you had lobsters crawling out of your ears. He would say, "Look at this data sheet. Use the best thing on the market that you can afford." Come on. Is it bent over on an awful lot on the other side? Or is it wedged in? Oh, I see what's going on. That that old solder doesn't want to flow. The uh, flux has kind of been driven out of it from not having flowed in a long time. Sometimes when you get things that are really stubborn, Rather than trying to remove all the solder, add some fresh solder. Hmm. He said before things did not want to move. There it goes. And things get much more amenable. I 
I'm sorry if I have the occasional sniffle through this. I, the oak trees in my neighborhood are uh, doing vile things at all times of the day and night. And, and that green, yellow gunk is everywhere. Now, a lot of people said they watched that video on the 68 Twin, the long one, and that it wasn't boring at all. And I'm watching myself do this, and I'm, I gotta say, are you sure? Because this seems like a good candidate for boring. And I appreciate the, the uh, have a bananas from everyone. I was uh, watching a travel channel called Jules Guides. I really like that channel. Fascinating facts and stories as he wanders around London because we're going to London later this year. And I, I want to know where I am and, and all the, the cool things that had happened there in the past, be it, you know, where Charles II lost his head or where the Roxy Club used to be, where the Cure might have played with Su Susie Sue back in the day. Uh, anyway, one of his videos was on uh, Cockney Music Hall songs and uh, the locations that inspired them, which I thought that was interesting. That's a part of history and, and people's lives I don't know much about. So I was watching that while working the other day. And uh, apparently there's a, a Cockney song called Let's All Go Down on the Strand that was very popular in World War One, and, and one person would sing, let's all go down, this, go to the, down to the Strand and people would chime in with have a banana and uh, have a banana. So random things were running through my head at that moment in the video. So thanks for humoring my very strange request. I also think that uh, if I'm going to do a code word or phrase for people to put in the comments to show that they finished a long video, I also might need to do some other ones to make sure people don't skip ahead to the end just to get the secret phrase of the day. We shall see. The reason I'm not using the solder sucker here is there's not much solder left here in these eyelets and what it where there is it's kind of embedded down in the nooks and crannies and uh, on the surface and this braid does a, a better job overall of getting that kind of stuff out. And I'll be revisiting what these wires, how these wires are attached in just a moment because, uh, Sometimes I take them out if they're, sometimes they'll corrode and I'll take them out and replace them with fresh bus wire. And I've got a lot of bus wire with which to do such things. But if I can keep the old ones, just neaten them up, I will. I feel the need to say something just to keep less dead space. Um, I know no jokes. I've never enjoyed jokes as in, you know, a set sequence of words you, you say with a punchline, etc. I like situational comedy much better. Not sitcoms, but, you know, stuff more derived from improv or uh, absurd comic principles when the rule of three is done very, very well, etc. So I, the only jokes I can ever remember are like the worst jokes I've ever heard in my life. For some reason, those are stuck in. All right, before I start rearranging how these wires are going to go, I want to get off a lot of the old flux and the dirt that it traps along with it on the board. That one's a thirsty little one. 
So we'll use the solder, solder sucker in there. And let me give them all a, a quick inspection. I got some here and here I need to get up. All right, now for the real sexy glamorous part of the job. Hopefully I'll be zoomed in enough you can see this, but hopefully I haven't been working like this the whole time. Sorry, I can't, I keep forgetting to look up at where the camera viewfinder is. Uh, if that's the case, please forgive me, though you've probably all switched off at this point. Uh, I find a flathead screwdriver breaks up that old flux very easily. I'm using barely any force at all. I'm not scratching the fiberboard. I'm just breaking up the big lumps of dirty old flux. Because Not because of the flux by itself. The flux can, over time, become conductive. But because it traps so much dirt, and uh, it can trap it inside a solder joint if you apply fresh solder on top of this stuff. So, by roughing it all up like this, it will wash off very neatly and easily with isopropyl afterwards. But if you put the isopropyl on first, everything I'm getting up here is, is kind of a dust, turns into a gummy mess, smears everywhere. So I have found this is the neater sequence, the easier sequence to do things in. And then I'll do the top side. Sometimes you get really bad piles of, of flux around the eyelet. Sometimes the eyelet gets blackened areas. This one looks pretty good. here. All right. So now I'm going to clean all this, but first I'm going to brush this dust off in the trash can. One of my most essential tools are these really cheap bristle brushes at Home Depot for like 75 cents each. I buy like 10 at a time and use them for everything. And I need to find a better version of this dispenser for alcohol because it if I do it at an angle, it'll leak out of the cap. The, uh, the seal on the cap is not good enough to keep the alcohol from coming out. Tried Teflon tape in there, and the alcohol just dissolved it. So then I had, I had nasty little white floaters. So that, that didn't work out. But while I recognize that I need to do that, I've not made the time to do that. Maybe I'll do that tonight. I'm not sure how to search for that. Alcohol dispenser probably would be a different Google result than I want. Though, you know, if you see me next week wearing one of those baseball hats that's supposed to hold two beer cans or something, maybe, maybe it would work for that. Mm, look at all that tone we're losing. Mm, losing all that tone. Let me grab some fresh paper towel. There are things that I will use a cloth reusable rag for. 
But when it comes to soldering things at high heat, I don't like things that burn. All right, what I want to do next, I'm, a, I'm going to give this another cleaning, but first I want to neaten up all of these wires and reuse them. So this one's loose here, it's still connected at this end. I want to loosen this up at this eyelet. Can you see this? Yeah. You can see the alcohol being driven away from the eyelet as it heats up. That's also how you get DC out of a fender board is you soak it in isopropyl a little bit more than I've shown here. And then you use a you know, time and or a heat gun to get most of it to evaporate. And then you uh, heat up the eyelets like that, which just drives the um, alcohol away from the hot metal eyelet in concentric rings. And it pushes any water ahead of it. The alcohol displaces the water from the board. so. The alcohol drives the water out of the board. The heat drives the, the alcohol away from the board and you end up with no DC. And that's how I just tightened up those. You can see a little bit more moisture coming out, a little bit of steam. When I'm done getting them all neatened up, I'll go and trim off the excess a little bit, but not there yet. Here, I want to see, there's one wire which is going this way, one wire which is going this way. I want to see which of these ends is which. All right, so the small one is going this way. Let's get them to separate from each other. I can get that to come through a bit more, okay. This is hard for me to see, so. Normally I would pick it up and squint at it. I'm trying to let you guys see it. I need to straighten this out so I can get a little more, a little of the excess on the rear out. Sorry if I'm doing a little bit of this off camera, so to speak. I have to be able to see it though. Need to move this one here. You guys sure you're not bored? A little extra, excess solder in there. Let me get that out. A little extra solder in here too. I was trying to lean the soldering iron in the stand in such a way that it wouldn't go into its timer thing, but it seems to be impossible. All right, so that's sideways and that's diagonal. I think it would have been faster for me to take all this out and do it fresh. But, you know, when I can leave something original in that's still good, and it doesn't take a lot more time, 
make these things go in the right direction. I don't want them just coming through the holes the way they were before. I want them mechanically pressured where the, to where they're supposed to be. <coughs> because uh, it's more reliable. It's one less thing that can go wrong. I mean, if every connection in one of these amps were as solid as this, the amp would work without solder. In which case you'd be adding solder just for the sake of keeping corrosion out of the metal to metal contact areas. And to uh, minimize heat due to any gap in metal to metal. But um, solder is not an adhesive. So by doing this, and I've said this in a lot of videos, but I never know when this is going to be the first video of mine someone sees, or if this is the first time they've heard me say the particular thing, though I end up saying it a, a lot over time. All right, so now I need to do these. Let's see. We're almost done with this boring part. Then we'll go off to the new and exciting boring part. Ha. Ah. In this case, it had a lot more slack on one end than the other. So I can do something about that now. Come on, you know we want to bend over. Boy, that sounded weird. Oh, I've crossed, I've crossed streams. Need to move this one out of the way. I do this all the time without such drama. That's when I'm not filming the entire process usually watching a documentary or a movie or something. It's another reason the, uh, I don't know, the uh, these long real-time videos, I won't do them all the time because sometimes I just want to do the thing I, I've done a thousand times while listening or watching to an old Lord, Lord, of the, you know, Lord of the Rings or an old Bond movie or a documentary on the English Civil War, you know, like you do. I'm kind of weird, or so I've been told. All right, so now we've got good mechanical connections. This one's harder to make it tight because it has a curve, so you can't really get it tight until it's soldered, but I feel good about that. I'm gonna snip off some of this excess because it's nice to have it look neat. And I'm making sure it doesn't go flying across the room to be found next time I'm barefoot. All right, I think I'm going to run to the kitchen and get a cup of coffee. And I'm going to pop.
pause the recording here and resume right back at the same spot. All right, we're back with coffee. And it's about to get to the part where it goes fast again, but I like to do one more really good isopropyl bath at this point. May not be necessary, but I've never regretted saying, hey, everything was too clean. I should have held back a bit. And it doesn't take a lot. You know, the same front and back, just concentrating on where the eyelets are. That all, pardon me, that, that all looks good. And uh, I'm not going to worry about the surface area so much as uh, heating up the eyelets. I want to see that I've got really good dry areas around each eyelet. The in-between stuff will take care of itself pretty much. And they'll continue to expand because that eyelet is hot for a good long while. And I do this on every 60s fender that comes in that I recap. And I don't have weird little noises in apps I've done this to. You know, the difference between a pretty good ground and a really good ground can be an appreciable difference in noise. It only takes a few tenths of an ohm for things not to be ideal. So let's make things ideal since we can. This also makes this board material pretty much brand new when you're done. It's like time travel. which is pretty cool when you think about it. I have done this to entire fender boards. I will often have to do this in areas on fender main boards where there is DC leakage heated up. And I, as I've showed in that twin reverb video, I will also often remove the backing board entirely and clean it and then re reinstall it, especially on one that has wax. I'll pu pull those old wax backing boards out and uh, get all, you can see some residue from the, from the isopropyl there. That's really doesn't, doesn't affect anything. Anyway, I'll get all the wax off the backing board. And then sometimes on those old wax fender main boards, what I'll do is I will take some paper towel and sandwich it between the, the circuit board and the chassis and then I uh, will get in there with my heat gun and get everything hot and then press down and a lot of time, and then lift the board up and the wax will transfer to the paper towel, which can then be removed. And that's a way to remove problematic wax buildup on the back of a fender main board without taking the entire amp apart. Though I, I have done that as needed and will not hesitate to do that. When needed, it is a substantial labor cost for the owner. So if we can avoid that, that's always preferable. Anyway, let's repopulate this. We're gonna start with these two watt vishes, like I mentioned. I gotta remember to be over here, not over here. Sorry. Start with the two 220 Ks. And uh, I can use my lead bender, but I can just I, I can just eyeball these pretty much. So there and there. And then I just bend it over on itself.
and I like to have the uh, resistor tolerance bands consistent as I work. So in general, I have any vertical oriented bands with the tolerance band facing down and any horizontal ones with the bands to the right. That's that's what most of the offenders from the factory did. Let's see, this one's got the blue stripe, so it's a 4.7K. It's gonna go right here. I am red, green, color blind, so I don't even bother to try to remember the color bands because I can't see half the time what the colors are. But I know a 4.7K has got a, I just said that, then I got the tolerance band wrong, sorry. But I know the 4.7K has got a blue band in there. So I know that that's that one, and the other one's a 1K. I know that they're 1K and 4.7K, et cetera, because I took them out of the Mauser package right before doing this. And uh, when I get a new package from Mauser or CE or DigiKey or any place, I will usually confirm with the meter that what's in the bag actually is what it says on the outside, and these all were exactly as described. So... I don't have to use color bands. I can read what it says on the on the package. But I did confirm that. I'm tr trimming off the excess while leaving just that little bit there. So, you know, mechanically they're in place before solder is applied. Now, most of these solder joints on this, I will redo after the board is not only back in place on the amp, but is screwed back in place because when you attach those screws, the board will flex. And I don't want to break any solder joints from flexing. But the uh, these joints here for these 220Ks, I do that ahead of time because they're gonna have capacitors here and here, and I don't wanna burn a capacitor trying to reach these. So what I'll usually do is I'll get them up like this upside down. And I'll do them from the back. Wait for the magic beep. Thank you, meter. Or not meter. Thank you, iron. Thank you, Mr. Hacko. Sorry for the confusion the other day when I was talking about Hacko uh, cable glands versus Hacko soldering stuff. Hacko is H-A-K-K-O. Hacko is H-E-Y-C-O. And both the old style cable glands that just clamp in one direction and the new ones, which rotate, you know, have a rotational even pressure all around the circumference, are made by the same company, Heiko. And I could put the, the part numbers up on Mauser, but I think it might be good if you're serious about this to go to Mauser and find the uh, Heiko cable glands. and then read data sheets, learn to read data sheets. If you know the outer diameter of the cable you're going to use, you can find which HACO product has the inner diameter that matches that or accommodates that without any big excess. All right. So those are good. I got a little excess solder on that one. I mean, not so solder, sorry, a little excess flux on that one. Now before it sets up hard, I can just kind of smush it to the side. And I'll just take a small bit of ISO and clean that area up before I put the caps in place. All right, I'm gonna put the caps in place and each cap will also have a dab of clear adhesive sealant, silicone RTV beneath it, a very small amount. Uh, this is by Permatex. Tube Depot sells this, but they also carry it at O'Reilly's and uh, AutoZone and other automotive stores or where they have the engine gasket stuff, you know. You want, the, it has to be silicone and RTV, it means it's non-reactive, it won't, etch the plastic of any components it's used on. And it doesn't smell, it doesn't smell good, but it, it's not uh, outgassing constantly. 
So the caps. Got these MODs, which I just dropped one on the floor. So the caps, these MODs, I've had very good luck with these. Uh, I was dubious when they came out because how could it be good? It costs less than an FNT. It costs much less than a Sprig Adam. Sprig Adams these days are garbage. They are a, a small cap in the in a much larger cap's body. It is smoke and mirrors, and I've had failure modes with them. So I don't use the overpriced, under quality Sprague Adams anymore. Uh, but the uh, F and T's are fantastic, and so I didn't trust these because they're smaller and th they cost less. But I had some other tech friends who said they were quite good, and so I ordered a bunch and tried them, and I tested them and I tested them, and I put them in an app, and uh, that was here for quite a while. I continued to use F and T's and other things while I, I continued to test the, the app that had the MODs. After six months, they were they were fine. So I continued to use them. Now I did hear from one guy I know that there was a bad batch of the 20 microfarads, but they were apparently identified by the distributor and removed from the market. I have not had any problems with those. So I like to, as you can tell, I pre-bend. So all the caps are already pretty much where they want to be. And I bend them so that when they're in place, the value 20 microfarad, 500 volts, uh, or in this case, 70 microfarad, 350 volts, is visible. I don't like it if someone has to guess what's in an amplifier. I, I guess I could see someone wanting them, you know, all to have MOD in a row because it's pretty. But if anyone does it so they're all like this in a row, that person's a psychopath. Anyway, so I'm just doing the pre bend where I know it's going to want to be and it'll reach, and I've got a little bit of slack in this I can adjust within a certain range on each end. And I have a very gentle curve just done with my thumb. Some people use tools for this, and that's great too. Uh, you can just, people will use, oops, I dropped the cap again. Trouble with round things, they roll. People will use, uh, this one's not great because it's got a square profile, but uh, the rounded profile of a, of a handle on a screwdriver or, or pliers or whatever. But I find that my thumb is usually pretty handy. What was that saying about situational humor earlier? I'm not sure if I'm really approaching it, but I have aspirations. Now this stuff comes with a dispenser cone thing that you snip the tip off of. And I found that that gets filled with silicone and then hardens up and is useless. So what I do is I can either apply it to the board or I'll apply it to the cap. In this case, I'm gonna apply a very small amount to the bottom of the cap. And remember which end goes where on the series, the ground's over here. Put it in place. Then on the back, I bend over. Again, this sounds weird to say. So that there's a mechanical connection there. There's no real stress on the leads. And then before everything sets up in a solder in place, I can kind of neaten everything up. Then I'll do the next one. And when I'm done with this, I will take a little bit of paper towel, I'll wipe off any uh, silicone which is oozing out, and I'll just put the cap back on. And I can use the same $9 tube for about six months, I found. Back when I was using the little snip the end plastic cone dispenser that it comes with, they'd last about three weeks and then it would just all get all clogged up and the silicone would dry. Which is not as much fun as it sounds. I used to put it on the board, supposed to on the cup, but I found that I'd end up with more than I wanted and it would smear. Also, if you have it on the board first and you think you're being clever, you put it all, all every place, you put some silicone every place the cap's gonna go before you put the caps in place, you end up invariably, at least I do, getting it all over your hands, which is not ideal. I do not recommend it. Ah. Uh, 
Come on, why aren't you going in there? There you go. Like here, I've got a little extra at this end, so I can nudge the bend a little bit different. There we go. That's the only one so far that required any extra finessing. It only takes a little bit. The silicone's job is just to keep the cap body attached to the board so that there's no strain uh, on the uh, cap leads. Now, why is that not want to go in? And it only takes a little bit to hold it. And these caps have very low mass, so there's not any real stress on them. I need to finesse this end as well. And the uh, lead beneath the board is wanting to interfere, but I have convinced it to play nicely. All right, so that's a good look there. Now I'll go through here and First, I'm about to remove that excess, but first I'm going to tear off this bit of used uh, paper towel from back when this bit of paper towel in the trash can was all soaked in isopropyl. It has since dried out, so I can reuse it for little bits of rag. See, I am I am efficient. Then I put the cap back on, and then this stays usable for about six months. And in general, unless you're building a, a, a car amp, this lasts a long time. Uh, you can roll it like you know from the bottom like a tube of toothpaste as necessary. If you do it too aggressively on that rolling though, the uh, metal outside can spring a leak, which is not fun because then you have silicone oozing out at random places. Sounds like a hell of a second date. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? Okay, yeah, just snipping off the, the excess length while leaving enough hooked beneath for mechanical support. Just enough to hold it in place, but if the next tech in 20 years needs to replace these caps and tries to pull them up from, from beneath, uh, she will probably be successful, though she'd be better off doing as I've done in removing the board to have access. All right, so this is ready to go back into the amp. Let me have a sip of my coffee and clear some space, and then I'll get the amp back out, and we'll do that. All right. Make sure everything's visible again. doop a doop a -do. Guess I need to zoom out a little bit. Is that in focus? Looks good. Let's see. We should be good. Okay, now it's a matter of feeding these wires back through the holes that they were in before. I almost said something regrettable continuing the uh, second date joke, but I'm a classy broad. Let's get this in here. That short little ground connection never wants to play ball. I urge patience because if you force it, it'll just mess up the insulation. It'll happen when it's ready. Almost got it. Let's see. I know you can't see everything I'm doing here, but I'm trying to get this. There it goes. The insulation was getting caught on the edge of that hole. I don't, I don't want to 
sometimes the cloth insulation on these wires gets fragile with time, so try to be careful with that. All right, that's all back. Let me put the screws back in place. Come on, there you go. I haven't fully tightened that one yet. Hmm, this one's not wanting to catch. Aha, there it is. The reason I didn't fully tighten this one is because I knew this one hadn't been located yet. If I had fully tightened that one down, I couldn't have moved the board like you just saw. So now that they're both centered, I can tighten them both down. All right. So of these ones on the rear, only this one over here has a wire going to it. All the others are internal connections. So I'm going to do those first. And kind of nudge things around a little bit while I wait for the magic beep. All right. And as always, when soldering, you heat up the things you're connecting and bring the solder to that heated connection. You don't put a bunch of solder on your soldering iron tip and then paint it onto the wires and eyelets and such. That was one of the first things I learned when soldering, and I learned it the proper way, the hard way. Built something I was really proud of, and in the middle of gigging, things started to not work anymore because uh, all the solder joints were bad and grainy and cold, and so wires just popped out. Now I'm putting in this process some uh, flux on the board that I'm not a big fan of, as I've mentioned. So I'll be cleaning as I go. And like I mentioned in the uh, other, uh, the second long video, the tw uh, 20 minute video on the twin I did, these domes are purely cosmetic to make them look like they did originally as they left the fender factory when these things were all soldered upside down and gravity made the domes. And they are not necessary for good performance. It's just a, what we expect to see inside a fender kind of thing. So I broke up the excess flux on the board. Now I'm just gonna get in there and clean up after myself. Little bits of flux dust I created. All right, I'm gonna do this negative first. I'm doing this work at 750 degrees Fahrenheit with a hacko because I'm heating up eyelets, not just wires. I'll often work at 700 or 725, 725, but I find the eyelet stuff to heat up an eyelet thoroughly. You want to be at least 750. 800 will work, but at 800, sometimes you end up cooking the flux too much. The flux will get real dark and that's not really that pretty. Let's see if I can get this wire down in here better than that. All right, now I've got it hooked inside, so it's going underneath the eyelet 
as a little hook. Again, a little bit of mechanical support. All right, I'll do the brown one next because these three yellows tend to be the bane of my existence. I really wish Fender had used a larger eyelet or a different wire layout. It's just very difficult to get a resistor lead, a capacitor lead, and three wire leads into uh, one eyelet. Though time and time again, I managed to make it happen again. It's always a feeling of just barely pulling it off. Trying to get that little bit of a hook again. I really do. I'm pretty confident that all these wires here were installed to this board and left long and then put through the hole and brought into the chassis, twisted on the other side, then steered to where they go on the various boards inside. But that this connection was always hooked from the factory upside down before everything was installed. I have gone through and watch, watched uh, available videos of production work in the Fender factory. But none, none of the videos I have found have shown those things or had detailed views of amp assemblies on the bench. Though I have seen videos, I, th I think, or photos, I don't recall if it's a photo or a video, of the brass plate which already had all the pots on it. It's on it and everything soldered and ready to go in the app. Notice with my screwdriver here, I was holding this in place while the solder set up. As I mentioned before, if you allow things to move around in a solder joint while the solder cools, the solder will uh, give you a gray, dull, uh, non-shiny solder joint. It tends to be brittle and tends to let go of things. You can even get air bubbles, which is not a good thing. And again, Captain OCD here is cleaning as he goes. I do it in the kitchen, might as well do it here. Some of this stuff I know electronically almost doesn't matter, but you know, I, I take pride in my work and um, there are so many ways, you know, on the one level, it's pride in my work, which, you know, can stray into ego, which is not a good thing. But there are so many things in here that if they're not done exactly right, bad things can happen. And if you allow yourself to start to say, oh, that doesn't matter that much. I can just do that really fast. You know, amps are easy. Ahem, ahem. You know, you're going to eventually get to the point where you miss something that, crucial because you're, you just get in the habit of saying, oh, that, that'll be good enough. So I find good enough is the enemy of the good. I don't think perfection is necessarily attainable. But we should strive for it. As I mentioned, this is the joint that is the bane of my existence. It 
it's one thing to fill it with solder and then just stuff wires into it and hope that everything holds while the solder sets. It's another to have all the wires stay in place before you apply solder. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I've almost got it. Hallelujah. All right, those are all being held in place mechanically before I solder. Wait for the magic beep. Thank you, sir. Cleanliness is next to codliness. All right, now I'm just going to knead out the lead dress a little bit as much as possible. And I know that all that is correct. Uh, if you're doing this yourself, Measure as you go, make sure that this is connected to here, that this is connected to here, that this is connected to here, 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 this is connected to here. Confirm 220K, 220K, do that before these caps are in place because they won't measure correctly when these caps are in place. Make sure that your cap leads are positive, 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 positive. So negative, positive, 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 positive. That's for twins, super reverbs, all the others that have caps in series. The Vibrolux Reverb and the uh, uh, Deluxe Reverb have two 16 microfarads in parallel, the, which look, look like this. Otherwise, they wouldn't have these resistors or the jumpers beneath the board. They would have a jumper here and a jumper here, and they would be positive, positive. Uh, make sure you have 1K and 4.7K uh, on some later ones uh, or Deluxe Reverbs. It's 10Ks. You know, check the schematic. Check what you're using throughout. Measure as you go. And at this point, if this were one of the first ones I had done, I would now remeasure everything for continuity and resistance to make sure I hadn't messed anything up before I powered it on. And I would bring this up slowly on a variac in case I had made a mistake. I know that I've not made a mistake. I've just done this too many times um, for there to be a mistake here. So I'm not going to worry about any of that. Uh, next time, I'll just power this on. But I think this has been a very, very long video. And I think a lot of you will enjoy this. Others will say, well, that was boring as hell. And uh, I'm somewhere in the middle. I enjoy doing this, but mostly I enjoy having done this. The actual process is pretty boring for me too. But it's so important to do it right because then everything sounds so great. You'll get to hear that soon. Until then, thanks for watching.